Hi, my name is Ian Spanier, and today I'm going to walk you through a two location photo shoot, very typical of the kind of stuff I do on a regular basis. We're going to be inside as well as outside, and I'm going to show you different ways that I use lighting in both scenarios. But I thought as a little added content, I would take you guys through sort of my thought process when I walk into a location for the first time and I have to figure out exactly how I'm going to do my lighting. So let's take a look at this garage and I'm gonna show you exactly what my mindset is, what I look for, the problems that I think I'm gonna to have to overcome. And as I always say, it's not problems, it's challenges that I'm looking to overcome. So what challenges are we gonna face here at this location? And I'm gonna basically just talk you through exactly what is going on in my mind as if I was talking out loud to myself. So let's take a look right now. We see this is actually kind of a tricky situation. There's not a lot to use in this environment. And usually when I'm shooting on location, I'm looking for a great wall, some great texture, anything that I can utilize to make the shoot more interesting. But in here, it's obviously not a lot to deal with. No offense to what the location is, but I think this is gonna definitely present some challenges. The very first thing I do when I walk into a location is look up. I always like to know what my ceiling height is. And what we can see here in this garage is we actually have some decent ceiling height, but it's gonna get cut by the garage door. It is quite warm today, so we're definitely gonna want that garage door open, plus we get the added value of a little bit of natural light coming in, which will just help us work, and having that natural airflow is definitely gonna be helpful today. So no matter what I do, I either have to make a decision of, am I gonna light with the option of having the high ceiling, or am I gonna light in a situation where I'm gonna be blocked by this ceiling height based on the door itself. So those are some variables that are gonna to have to kind of figure out as we go along and see what's gonna work best for me. Whenever I'm working in an environment, I have to decide if I'm gonna use that environment or if I'm going to basically eliminate the environment. And that's really where using artificial light comes in as a great element to being able to work and do anything at any time, anywhere. We're not gonna be working with a lot of equipment today because we wanna show really the fact that you do not need a cube truck full of gear in order to get a great shot done. The other things I'm gonna look at, today we're portable, but if I wasn't portable, I'd be looking around for outlets. I'd be making sure that I have ample power. I do carry in my kit those little uh, you know, doohickeys that let you know if there's power coming in and out of an outlet. Uh, I will look around and see what other lighting is in that scenario that may factor in. If we're gonna be shooting at a higher ISO, do we need to worry about overhead lights that are coming on or off? Are we gonna worry about color temperature? All of those are the sort of variables that are going through my head as I go along. So the scenario that we're creating today is we're gonna be working with a fly fisherman and we're gonna create a little scene of, as you can see some of the props in the background here, a fly fishing table and because there's not sort of that romantic thing that I think popped in my head when I first learned about this as our assignment for the day, you know, I was picturing, you know, trout pictures on the walls and fly rods basically like, you know, littering the walls and reels and, and fishing line and all sorts of beautiful things. And obviously we don't have that. So I'm gonna eliminate this environment in this case. I'm basically travel all the time with black velvet. It's something I think everybody should have in their kit. Just throw it in your car. Um, Joanne Fabric or any of those places you can get it. It's real cheap. I got a couple pieces that I have sewn together. So I give, give myself a big, I think it's like about eight by 10, something like that. And I think what I'm gonna probably do is figure out a way to rig up uh, black. So we end up with a black background, a little bit more dramatic. And then I'm gonna use our FJ 400s to light Scott, our subject today, and sort of make a more interesting scene. Think of it more so in the sake of um, a dark room where he's working on this and kind of the concentration is really just on what he's doing and no other elements because we don't really have those elements today to work with. So we're gonna concentrate a lot of light on him. We're gonna figure out the best way to utilize probably two lights today. And the reason I like to keep it 
down to two lights, one or two lights usually is, is kind of my MO because I like to keep things simple. It'll allow us to move, plus we've got to keep an eye on the sun as we're gonna be moving out to an outdoor location uh, later in this afternoon and showcase some of the lights outside. Okay, so we've done a test frame, made a couple of modifications. Basically what we decided on was using the FJ400 straight up. We just put the reflector on it and it's a nice, hard, solid light. Because I put that black background to cover up the environment that we didn't want to showcase, it was a way to really cut everything away. So I figured why not just focus all of the attention right onto Scott and the fly fishing setup that he's uh, the tying setup that he's got set up here. One thing I always say is that your eye will go to the brightest thing in a photograph. So naturally that's what we do. We look at eyes when it's a human being as our subject, or we look at the brightest thing. So whenever you're taking your test frames, you should always look at what is very bright in this image that might be distracting to the viewer. And in this case, all of our, the spools here are picking up our very hard light that we're utilizing. It's a very specular quality of light, it's silver reflector, so it's really popping a hard light at our subject. Uh, very similar to a bare sun, if you think about it that way. With this brightness, it's a bit distracting. We kind of take some attention away from our hero, Scott, here, so we're gonna cut that down. Something that I also think you should always have in your kit is called Cinefoil. Cinefoil is something you can get at most camera stores. It's basically a black, tinfoil type material that is utilized by uh, cinematographers and photographers all over the world to cut some light. So if you're ever in a pinch, you don't maybe you don't have enough stands, you don't have enough blockers, you don't have flags with you, this is a great way with a very flexible material to be able to block some light. So you can tape it or you can get it into place with a stand, whatever works, but it's a really easy thing to throw into your kit and just keep there uh, for something like this. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a little block to this light and cut some of that light and feather it off from the spools so we take the attention away from the color here and the white and all that stuff here and put more attention right on Scott. Because this is a very malleable material is if you want it to have sort of a natural effect, you can actually tear it and move it about, fold it over, whatever you need to do in order to sort of just subtly block that light. I talk a lot about the subtlety of lighting and how both in, in lighting on set and even just working in Photoshop once you're in post, everything should be subtle. You don't want things to scream out as you made a big major change. So when I flag this, if this is too harsh, I'm gonna probably fold it over, tear it, just make it look a little bit more like natural feeling, how light would fall naturally, not so much uh, artificially. So I'm just gonna take my hand and really just see where I need to block that light. And again, it's, it's hard to know unless we cut ambient completely because our eye is gonna make that adjustment. But what you can do is sort of turn this on and off. And if you turn it on and off, you can really see where that light falls. So right now we've cut it enough so that there's a little less light here and it really starts right about behind this first set of spools. So we'll take a look at a frame with the strobe firing and see if we like it. If we need more, I'm just gonna extend that cinefoil just a bit more. That's great right there. So one thing I did crop a little higher because we were getting a little distraction from the blanket down here. And I think that's a better crop anyway. Puts a little bit more attention. And if you look at the spools here, this is really where we're gonna see the biggest difference. So this right now is very bright and now we've cut it down quite a bit. So that cut down allows us to take some of that attention away from the, the spools that was distracting and focus more attention on Scott where our light really is trying to go. When we talk about distractions, the other thing you really need to look at is your subject. Uh, of course, if we're working on a fashion shoot or a big celebrity shoot, we're gonna probably have stylists and makeup artists and there's gonna be a lot of eyes on our subject and what's going on. But in 
case like this, where it's just me working with a single subject, I'm gonna have to look at a lot of things to make sure that there are not things in the shot that are gonna be distracting to the viewer. So one thing I noticed was because of the style of ball cap that Scott's wearing, we've got this with this harsh light, you've got this big block of black and then you've got this bit of light on his skin. And to me, that's a bit distracting. Plus as well, because the hat's black, it's fading into our background quite a bit. Now, we could open this set situation up by adding a fill light, but because I wanted to keep this pretty dramatic, I'm gonna not do that. So I just went ahead and asked Scott if he had a different hat, ideally one like mine that's fitted so it has this part closed and also a lighter color. So that's gonna help separate him from the background. The gray shirt I like because it separates enough from the black background and is not distracting at all, which is great. So uh, right now we have a lot of subtleness from here down. I just wanna complete the entire image, get a better hat, better situation, and we'll have a nicer separation from that background. Looking at this, I can see a couple things I wanna fix. The shadow because our cinefoil is not exactly perfect, is kind of pushing off a little bit to the right. So I'm gonna fix that. That shadow is sort of falling to the right a little bit as well. So that just means that my key light is not dead center. So I'm gonna get it dead center. All right, so I'm just gonna make that one last change on the light and then we'll go uh, fire a few frames off and uh, see what we come up with. Part of working with your subject to kind of get them more relaxed is to distract them. And that's a big psychological game I always play on set. Sorry, I just shocked my subject <laughs> right there. But when I talk to them about things other than the fact that I'm here taking a picture of them, then they start to relax naturally. The other thing that happens with that, which is great, is you'll start to really pick up, if you're paying attention, of course, of their natural tendencies, the way that they hold their hands when they're speaking, the way they might uh, make an expression. Those are all things that I pay attention to as I'm starting to work with the subject so that I can start to have ideas as the shoot's going on. And I might see somebody, let's say just for example, that when they're talking, they go like this, I'll pick up on that and I might have them repeat that. They might not even know they do that, but it's a great way to kind of find natural movements that your subject does so that you can make a more natural portrait. So something that I always try to do is give my subject a little bit of break from looking at camera. So I'll often pull them away from camera, move their eyes around so that they sort of stop focusing on the idea that they're having their portrait done. So it sort of distracts them as well. These are all things that I'm just doing to, again, push towards that more natural feeling final portrait. So what I always want to do is try to get my subject to just relax. And I mean, if you think about it, most of the time when somebody pulls a camera up to their face, the very first thing that people do is start to bring their shoulders up and start to stiffen up and think about what they're doing. Something that I learned from my mentor, Harry Benson, this famous photographer who came to America with the Beatles and has photographed every president from Eisenhower to uh, Trump, uh, basically is that he would sometimes not even load film in his camera. He would fire off a bunch of frames to get his subject to relax. And then he would throw film in the camera. Um, in the case where he might only have a, a minute or 30 seconds with his subject, of course he would have film in the camera, but he would rattle off some frames. And he always explained it to me that it was this idea of sort of the way an athlete would train and warm up. It's the same thing. You want your brain to start moving. So. I'll do the same thing. Now that it's digital, it's obviously much easier. You could fire off a lot of frames very easily. And something that I'll do is maybe start shooting just a little bit, getting my subject used to the strobe, getting my brain moving in a way, and at the same time paying attention to what my subject does naturally so that I can then capture that when I'm making that final portrait. Uh, first off, it's not a shoot until I'm lying on the ground. So at some point today, I'm sure I'll be lying on the ground. But the other thing I do is I find the worst place possible to stick my lights and challenge myself even more than I need to. Uh, so we're in a pretty tight environment here. And of course I decide I need to do a second option of this portrait. And putting this light in this very tight spot is gonna challenge me to get it exactly right. But somehow I always manage to do this.
Something I always say is that technical is important. I read all my shoots. I measure all my lights with light meter. It's something that I've done my whole career. It's something that I tell assistants and young photographers they have to do. You have to learn to read your lights. Particularly with artificial lighting, when you're using more than one light, it's so important to be able to understand what each light is doing and make sure that you're setting your camera properly in order to get the best output from each of those lights. So I've positioned Scott very specifically to work in this one very specific lighting scenario that I have, you know, basically here. And so I'm holding Scott very still in this case. It's not something that I would do all the time, but now that he's gotten a little bit more comfortable being on set and I feel like I can kind of get him there. This is not, not something, by the way, I would ever talk about normally in front of a subject, but in this case, it's fine. So I'm having him very specifically positioned and I'm having him have a point where he's looking in order to really take advantage of the lighting. It's a very hard cross light. And what I want is that little triangle on camera side. And that's just some technique that I like. It's just a, a look that I like. It's become part of sort of the signature of one of the things that I do. So in creating these portraits, I always wanna make sure that my style is brought into it. So that magazines can come to rely on a certain style. And that's where I will get continued you know, assignments basically is coming from that idea that this is a look that he does. We want this look in our magazine so we know who to call. So I've done my readings. As I mentioned earlier, I always want to make sure that I am doing a reading for each light individually and then together. And all with the intention that I know what aperture setting I'm already going to put my camera at. So today I'm shooting at f7.1, but I'm reading everything for f8. And that's a style that I always shoot with. I always like to have my histogram pushed to the right. For those of you who don't read your histogram, another thing you need to learn besides meters is learning to read your histogram. That LCD is great, but it's always going to be changing depending on the lighting situation that you're in. So understanding how to read that histogram is super important. So I'm doing Essentially, I, I thought of this as a two-stop difference. So my key light is two stops brighter than my fill light, the fill light being the seven-foot umbrella. But because I didn't like the feel of the light with that two-stop ratio, I went to a three-stop ratio. And I sort of end up living in that ratio quite often. I'm usually two to three stops difference between my fill light and my key light. And that's more just a stylistic decision. It's not something that necessarily is correct or the way to do it. It's just something that I like and you need to determine on your own what works for you. So I did my initial reading. I've got F8 on the key light and I've got F4 on the seven foot umbrella, but I dropped that down when I was behind camera to three stops difference, so it was F2.8. Okay, so we've wrapped up here in the beautiful garage and we're gonna head out to a much uh, prettier location out on the river and we're gonna set up a couple of different shots there with Scott uh, showcasing some of his fly fishing skills and uh, show you guys a little bit of how the FJ400s work on location. Okay, so we wrapped up our shoot by the river. Basically what I decided was with the weather changing as rapidly as it was, the sun going in and out, we should get our shots done and then I would kind of fill you in on everything we did. So first thing we did when we got to the river was realize that we wanted to optimize our time. We only had our model for so much time, so we wanted to make sure that we were able to get our maximum amount of uh, shots in and not waste time just sitting around waiting. So. One of the things that we took advantage of was sort of a backlit look. So I, I actually shot upstream into the sun, into the direction that the sun was coming from. And we put a light across the river and shot it back across the river at our subject. Now, some people could might argue that we could have just shot natural light on this whole thing. 
and for sure you can but the bonus that we got out of using some artificial light source was that we were able to add more information to the shot than was necessarily there now my hope is that what you can see is it's just an option for you we dragged all this equipment out might as well use it not every time we're going to but having the ability to do it gives us something else to look for and when I talked earlier about creating a style as a photographer, this is part of it. You want to be able to have a style or a look that people will define you towards. So when they hire you, they know this is a look that you do. And I'm definitely heavy on lighting, so figured why not we give it a shot. We added the extra challenge of having to cross the river. Uh, that presented some challenges in itself. But all in all, I think it was successful and I think the end result will really be worth it. So one of the things that you'll notice is that when we wanted to shoot just natural light, I had to really jack up that ISO, which is something that I don't love to do. Sure, there are times where I need that. It's a great thing about these cameras today is you can get away with it more, but I'm always somebody that has a preference towards shooting at lower ISOs. So with the strobe, I was able to shoot, I think at ISO 250, and that allowed me to capture the entire scene we added light to our subject and we're still able to capture the light that was coming in from uh, the sun and what was bouncing around the canyon. When I switched over to just natural light, I had to jack up the ISO in order to get a good exposure. Now, sure, there's a lot of information and there's a lot I can do in post with that. However, just that small advantage of adding a little bit of artificial light exactly where I wanted to aim it and light up Scott's face, that put me at an advantage that I prefer with a file that will have a little bit of a cleaner look. Now, one of the disadvantages of shooting at a lower ISO, even though it maybe gives a cleaner file, was that with the combination of the strobe, the shutter speed, and the ISO, I really wasn't able to completely freeze the fly fishing rod or the string in some cases. And that's something that I wanted to make sure that I captured. So. At the end of the day, if I'm handing this over to a client, I need to make sure that I have options available to them. So if they decide that some movement on the rod is okay, great, we've got it in the can. If they decide they really wanna see everything frozen in, in space, then I wanna make sure that I have that captured as well. So I went with a little bit of a middle ground. I pushed the ISO a little bit higher. We changed over to high-speed sync, which is one of the great aspects of the SJ 400s. And I was able to freeze action as well as still capture the scene in a very similar way and not go all the way as high as 3000 ISO. And I think you'll see in the results, it gives us sort of different looks. So for the money shot, setup two, this is really more in my wheelhouse of doing portraits. Yes, I shoot action from, uh, from time to time, but to be honest, action's not really something that I, I find myself super comfortable doing. So when it comes to a straight up portrait, that's definitely something I'm always aiming to do. So for this one, I actually turned Scott around and shot downstream. So now we had this light that was just changing, but what I was looking at was all the way across the road was this giant facade of a rock with the sun just blasting it, so super bright. And here I have Scott in the shade. Now this is a prime situation for lighting. So when you have a subject with a bright background and you're able to put them in shade and then light them through the shade, that is like perfection. It's something that quite often I will look for on location where I can intentionally put my subject in shade and then light them to balance with the background or to even overpower the background for a more dramatic effect. So in this case, I wanted to balance it, but just give a little bit extra to Scott. So I put a 43 inch uh, deep silver umbrella, the Apollo umbrella, which is one of my favorites. I personally go with the silver with the white diffusion. A lot of times the white on white is nice, but I like a little punch to my images. So that specular quality that I get from the silver kind of leans more towards my style. I set it up pretty close to Scott, so I would have a few options as far as the quality of light is concerned. I also like when it's closer, it's a nice softer quality of light, which I think went really well with what you see just behind Scott for the frames where I'm more pulled back, where you have this little softness of light that was happening more 
kind of mimicking the feel of the natural light that was bouncing off the sky and just lighting up the rocks and the water right behind him. Now behind him is this bright facade of a, you know, sheer rock face. And I'm balancing the light, I'm taking meter readings in order to make sure that I'm sort of just over on power from the strobe as to what's in the background. And I have a lot of room to go. The light was changing, as I mentioned earlier, so because it was changing, I was sort of kind of keeping an eye on Scott and at the same time keeping an eye on the background. And as it changed, I just played with my shutter speed in order to accommodate to it. It gives me a lot more options in post and it gives me an opportunity to have a few different looks to present to my client. One big recommendation I can make to you guys is that as you transition into the FJ400 series, one thing you should add to your cart is the plastic protective covers. They do not come with the light, but I tell you right now, these are things that will save your lights and protect that nice investment that you just made. I always bring these things on location. Now, the reason I have them in studio and on location is accidents do happen. So the last thing you wanna do is break a very expensive strobe Whereas you could just buy a plastic cover that will take care of it and allow you to feel a little bit safer on set. Some of the other things that you might notice on most of my sets are some of the non-lighting accessories that I have always around me. One of those things is the Cam Ranger 2. I love this thing because it allows me to send a image right to an iPad for my clients to see and it allows me to also take a bigger look at whatever I'm shooting so I'm not stuck just looking at a small LCD screen. Aside from that, I love the Peter Hurley water bags. These are great things to bring on location. I'm quite often traveling on planes and having to move a lot of stuff very quickly. And because I can fill these up on location, I'm able to throw three or four of those into my kit, bring them wherever I'm going and have some sandbags with me. This is important for safety. I like to make sure that my bags are weighing down my stands. Anytime you're shooting in wind, any situation where a light stand might go over, these things are critical. The third thing that I have on me all the time are spider holster materials. You might notice the hand grip on my camera. I also use the belt clip and the clip that goes on my backpack in order to free up my hands. As you saw probably from some of the behind the scenes pictures of the shoot today, we we're scrambling up and down some rocks, going through water, having my hands available to me is critical. So being able to put my camera in a safe position, lock it even if I need to, allows me to have two hands to utilize if I have to move the lights, anything like that gives me an opportunity to be hands-free. One of the things I hope you picked up today was the versatility of these lights. There's so many modifiers that you can add on, but even just bare bulbs with a reflector creates a lot of different looks and it all comes down to power settings and how you're utilizing these lights, what angle you're sending these lights towards your subject. These are all factors that allow you to have a, just a lot more options when it comes to how you're making your pictures, how you're creating imagery and how you're delivering deliverables to your client. Let us know in the comments below which are your favorite images and what modifiers you guys love to use on your sets. Thanks so much for watching. Join us again here at Westcott and I hope you enjoyed today's video.